Hi. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, how's it going? Uh, we're in the future. We have these awesome Borg-like conference badges, which are actually, if you haven't done it, get the app and install it. It's using this really neat flashing way of communicating. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Hillary. Uh, as we go, if you want to get in touch, I'm H. Mason on Twitter. I think we'll have a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, I hope everyone's had their coffee this morning. Uh, but I wanted, before I really jump into uh, to the talk, I wanted to get a sense of who's actually here in the room today. So how many people here are developers? If you don't mind, just putting your hand up. All right, this is awesome. How many people would say they're more on the data science side? We've got a few. OK, you guys had better clap. All right, and how many people here on the business side? OK, cool. So developers rule the, wor rule the wor room, and that is awesome. All right, so I'm going to talk about the future. Uh, it's a, a privilege with a keynote to be able to open up something that hopefully will lead to a lot of discussions for the day and to help frame the conversation here at the conference as we go. And in order to talk about the future, I wanted to start in 1880. This is the United States map in 1880. And uh, they had a really hard data problem to solve. Uh, the, 19, the 1880 census took seven years to compile. So just counting all the people in the United States at that time took seven years. Uh, and yet, we have a census every 10 years. Uh, and population grew like mad in the United States between 1880 and 1890. So this was a big data problem. It was not going to be possible to count the population in time for the census to start over again. And no matter, technology could solve it. There were several reasons why at that point in the late 1880s, uh, the first sort of data engineering projects started up. Uh, we had industry, we had easy access to factories and machinery. Uh, and we had people who were capable of thinking this way. This is Herman Hollerith. He's a New Yorker. Um, and he came up with an idea. He was inspired uh, to create this patent called The Art of Compiling Statistics. You can actually go read this patent. It is fascinating, and the drawings are incredible. Um, and this is a patent for a machine that will count the US Census in the patent document itself. It is a special purpose computing machine for counting people around the country. Um, and he was inspired to create this, to have this idea by the way train operators use tickets. So at that time, if you rode the train, you would pay, and then the conductor would mark a ticket, and they'd say, oh, here's a woman probably around this age wearing this color, sitting in this seat. Uh, and that's how they would know if you'd actually paid your fare. And he saw these tickets, and he thought, oh, we could use these to count people everywhere, not just on trains. Um, and this is what the machine looked like. Uh, it's actually, it doesn't look like it's from the 1880s, does it? Um, here on the right are the, my right, the, uh, the cards they would store. On the left is the counting machine. And he, he started a company called the Tabulating Machine Company. Now, Vint Cerf has a, a brilliant quote uh, where he says that if engineers had named Kentucky Fried Chicken, they would have called it Hot Dead Birds. Um, <laughs> and so later on, they went through a bit of a rebranding exercise and merged and became a company we all know today as IBM. And here were a couple of the operators, the census operators, out in the field punching cards. Most of the operators at that time were women uh, creating this data on punch cards. And this is what the card looked like. Um, these cards are 120 bits. Uh, that means a tiny amount of data. And uh, this is the key for deciphering what they meant. Uh, you can actually go deep down this rabbit hole and find the PDFs that describe uh, the manual for using this map to understand the data punched in the cards. And I went about two hours into it and gave up. Um, but I did figure out that you couldn't fit a tweet on a single standard 80-column IBM punch card. In fact, if you were using 7-bit ASCII, you'd still be three characters short. 
Uh, and somebody replied to this last night and said, you know, the funny thing about punch cards is that the data is stored in the absence of the card, not in the place where the card is, uh, which is kind of a, a funny observation. And there was something else funny about this system. Uh, the punch cards that they used were the exact size of 1887 US currency, which if you're not a currency nut, looked like this, which is way more badass than our currency today. It was about 15% larger, and I had a buffalo on it. Um, and they were the size of US currency because Hollerith got access to a bunch of Treasury Department boxes to store the cards. Uh, and so there's always a reason why things are the way they are, right? And it usually happens to be some moment of coincidence in time that does made technology be designed the way it is. And I was reminded of this when I saw this post on Superuser recently. About half the room, I think, is going to laugh, and those are the people old enough <laughs> to get this. And if you don't get the answer, ask me later, and I'll tell you what A and B were used for. So there's always a reason why things are the way they are, and it might not make sense now, but it definitely made sense at the time. So the 1890 census, with these machines, they actually solved the problem. And this opened up a new way of thinking about the world. And this is a really silly, fundamental question to ask. What did punch cards do for us? Well, they made the world computable. So before, a human being looking at a vast number of things is extremely slow and makes a lot of errors in trying to count it. But a machine designed just for counting those things is incredibly effective. And this is basically a superpower. Let's see if this works. Yes! <laughs> and I have the superpower of getting animated GIFs to play in Keynote, if anyone would like to know how to do that. <laughs> but this was the first time that computability became a superpower. Um, it's analogous to when John Napier created his first book on natural logarithms, where before we had a world where certain tasks were very difficult, uh, and then suddenly things became possible that were never possible before just from this innovation in math. But this was the first time the innovation was in compute. So let's fast forward. It's today. It's 2013. And I'm sure we have a lot of Reddit fans in the room. Uh, this was one of my favorite posts of all time, and I, I'd like to share it uh, just to set the context of where we are in 2013 with our technology. Somebody asked this question, if someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about life today? And the answer, of course, is this. I possess a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to look at pictures of cats and get in arguments with strangers. <laughs> right. <laughs> we've made the world computable, and this is where we've gone. So no, no discussion of this is complete without making fun of some uh, buzzwords. And big data is a term that bothers me, and it bothers me as an engineer. Um, it bothers me because it is so indistinct. Like, how big does it have to be to be big? Uh, and some people believe big data is data too big to fit in Microsoft Excel. <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, that's one definition. Another is data too big to fit on one computer. Uh, for analysis, and that's a more engineer-friendly definition. It means you need specialized infrastructure, uh, software and hardware, in order to work with a data set of that size. But it's still problematic, because what this computer is capable of is changing rapidly. And I can do analysis on my MacBook Pro laptop today that I used to have to use a really fancy machine for two years ago. Uh, and big data is just getting bigger. So I like to use this definition that big data is data made useful, by which I mean the infrastructure exists for us to ask questions of the data and get the answer back before we and our frail human minds have forgotten why we asked the question in the first place. So big data is data that is useful to us in our frail, creative, human, cognitive state. 
And we've seen the emergence of people who have these, I heard earlier, crazy MapReduce question asking skills. These are data scientists. Um, I guess that's my job title now. So data scientists are people who blend skills that haven't been blended before. What data scientists do has been possible for many years. And we've seen it be very successful, particularly in fields like finance. Um, but what data scientists do today is blend together the mathematical ability to write predictive algorithms with the engineering ability to get the data out of the database and into a useful form and to run those algorithms on that data. And then they also have that ability to ask good questions. And we might call that domain expertise, or we might call it the social science side of data science. But it's those capabilities in one professional. But I don't think that's enough. So this is Obama on the campaign trail in the first campaign. And I love this photo. It's a little hard to see on these screens, so look at the side, because every single person in the audience there has their device. So Obama is creating his set of media and data around this event. Every single person there is creating their own set of data around this event. Uh, this is social data. And more and more of our communication is moving online. Uh, I'm not going to try and come up with a specific statistic, but I believe we all know this to be true. We communicate mediated through devices. So today, the analogous question to what did punch cards do for humanity is what does big data and social data do for us? Or what can it do for us? Um, we are making our humanity computable. And we're able to study human communication at the scale at which humans are communicating. I find that mind-blowing. We're understanding the monkey. And this field is being called computational social science. On the academic side, it exists at the nexus of many different academic fields, physics, computer science, political science, anthropology, uh, people using the same algorithmic techniques on the same kinds of data. Uh, to come up with new ways of looking at systems and humanity. I've seen people who work at startups that have uh, sensors on people's bodies do with one query what hundreds of millions of research dollars couldn't do in the scientific community. It is really exciting. I saw a great quote the other day, computation is the new handmaiden of science, uh, meaning that computation is replacing mathematics as the handmaiden of science. Uh, and that came from this article, which if you're on your laptop, I'd really recommend looking up. It is about, it's in communications of the ACM, it's about a paper where they used modern descendant languages to algorithmically reconstruct their ancestor languages, um, collaborating with linguists to give them a superpower to make computable something that a linguist working manually could never attempt before. It's amazing work. But most social media is not that. Most social media is people talking to each other about celebrities and sports and who's dating who. Uh, it is essentially the biggest database of human gossip ever collected. Uh, and from this, we can learn all sorts of things. We can uh, start to understand how people interact, and then we can use that to build products. And we're just at the beginning of starting to see this happen. I wanted to walk through a few examples of things we've learned in the last few years and a few products that are really taking advantage of them. Uh, looking at these dimensions, we can, and this is not a, a formal academic taxonomy, it's something I made up to make this presentation narrative work, but we can look at time and space, the two fundamental dimensions of our experience, and we can add in the human ones, identity, communication, and emotion. Now, I'm going to share many examples from Bitly. Uh, I've been the chief scientist at Bitly for four years, and I'm scientist emeritus, meaning still working with them. Um, Bitly has great social data, and it was an accident. So I'll tell you how that happened briefly. Bitly makes big things small, and then you share them on the internet. When you click a Bitly link, you get a 301 redirect somewhere else. And these links show up everywhere. Um, they're used by a lot of different people. Uh, and on all sorts of different platforms and for different use cases. And even in places like this, I put a little paper doll dress on her because the point was not the lady in her underwear, but rather that behind her in the preview for Star Trek was a bit.ly link. Okay, this is winning the internet. And there was a secret trailer 
for Star Trek Into Darkness. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so this like made my year. Um, so this, entirely accidentally, gives us insight into how people are sharing bits of content across all the mediums that people use to share bits of content. Uh, and it really wasn't designed that way. It is a global phenomena. This is actually from 2011. It is a map we made with just points by latitude and longitude. There's actually no geographic map here from one hour of clicks. Um, like New Relic's website traffic, it's used more in the countries that speak English and then Brazil and Japan, uh, places that love the internet as much as we do. This was a total surprise. Bitly happened at a confluence of events in time and the internet community where it was able to scale very quickly and become something that is uninteresting when n equals one, but very interesting when n equals tens of billions. So in time, what can we learn? And this is, uh, I think the Red Sox did something interesting yesterday. This is a, so there are people from the East Coast here. That's great. Um, this is a graph of clicks per second. That is attention across the entire social web through Bitly's data to the phrase Red Sox with a huge burst at the end when they actually won their game. Uh, you can play with this yourself at rt.ly. Um, this is how people share on social media in time. The half-life of posts on Twitter is 2.8 hours. Um, that's in the aggregate, though. The most important thing is to share when everybody is awake. Uh, and you can jump in and see usage peaks during business hours. It's more diffuse for Facebook. Tumblr parties all night, probably because of their demographics. And the way we use our devices change our behavior, too. That is, uh, I lost a big bet on this one and had to buy a lot of beer. But um, tablets are used more in the evening, and they're used to look at more uh, consumptive material, not as active. Desktop machines, meaning laptops as well, are used during the business day. People use their mobile devices whenever they're not using something else. Uh, and the way people use these devices is really interesting in that the Kindle is used unlike any other device but iPhones and Android phones are used exactly the same. Uh, no surprise there. So time is an interesting dimension, and I wanted to, uh, to call out, or I'm not gonna call out the most frequent project with time, which is high frequency trading. We all know that exists, and it's not that interesting. What's much more interesting is Lauren Talbot at Data Gotham. Uh, she worked for the New York City uh, Mayor's Office of Analytics. Uh, for the last two years, and she's now a student at the new Cornell Technion in New York. And she talked about this project they did where uh, they were worried about ambulance response times in New York City. And as a resident of New York City, I too am worried about ambulance response times in New York City. And part of the problem was uh, the calls get handed off to different, they go into the central 911 response operator set, they get handed off to the police department, the fire department, uh, EMS, depending on what the nature of the emergency was. And they looked at this process and tried to connect uh, what the flow of calls looked like. Uh, and this meant, in some cases, taking PDFs and making them something they could actually compute with. It was very messy data. But she and her team managed to figure out how to link it all together. They were able to do things as simple as change the order of the questions the operator asks when you call in and which agencies handle which kinds of responses. And they reduced ambulance response times by a minute in New York City. It's a huge deal. That's saving lives um, in time. And she gave a wonderful talk about it that's on YouTube if you're curious about the project. And moving on to geography, this is a 3D print of clicks from last January in Texas, um, normalized. But I, I love this because, one, you can touch it and it actually hurts. It's a PLA, it's kind of hard. Um, second, you can see that Texas is a really interesting state. It has multiple population centers and multiple big empty spaces. Um, it's a really, the communications of Texas uh, are not evenly distributed and they really are very urban. Um, and we can see this if we look into different, the way people read about different topics, right? So I love pizza, I'm from New York, you probably got that already. Um, this is what people read about if they are reading about pizza in New York City, right? It is cheap and it has cheese on it and it's good. And by the way, if you ever visit New York and you want New York pizza, it's all New York pizza. Like there's a place on every block, it's great. Um, and it shouldn't cost more than a two dollars. Um, but here in San Francisco, this is what <laughs> passes for pizza. 
and I don't know what is up with this. <laughs> and if we go to Rome, here it is. Um, I don't speak Italian, but uh, you know, this is what people in Rome are reading about their pizza, and it looks pretty delicious. Um, and I love pizza as an example because it's something that all of humanity cares about, and yet what we consider to be pizza is really different ge geographically. Uh, but taking this a little bit more seriously, this is a project Bitly did with Forbes about a year ago, uh, where we looked at readership of different publications by state. So computed the mean readership for each publication and then looked at the difference from the mean by state. So it's not raw readership. If it was that, it would be all HuffPo and New York Times. Um, but it is instead um, what things are significantly interesting geographically. And there are a few phenomena in here that are interesting, like NPR is disproportionately consumed in Oregon. <laughs> You're hippies. Um, the New York Times in New York, uh, Fox News in Texas, no surprise, right? And my favorite is The Onion in Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin's awesome. Right? And so uh, improving on this idea, the team just released a real-time version of this. This is actually another animated GIF. Um, so you can go search for Bitly Media Map, and you can see this. Uh, and it's using a 10-minute window of influence, so giving a real-time version of the same data. Uh, and just because we are nerds, uh, if you want to get uh, into the tech details, this is using a really neat uh, real-time in-memory database that Bitly came up with for storing non-stationary categorical distributions. Um, that is forgetting data intelligently built into the key value update of the database. So it's cool stuff, and uh, that's on GitHub. All right, so geography, we take this for granted. Um, I've been told not to use this as an example. This is the Google Maps traffic layer because nobody thinks it counts as data anymore. Uh, it's sort of like your spam filter. That's not data anymore. It's just something we use every day, uh, which is, of course, why it is a great example. Um, another good example, um, I've heard that weather is a foreign concept here in California. But when you travel somewhere else, it becomes very important. And here is an app called Dark Sky on the iPhone. Um, what they do is really neat. They take the public weather data. They take your GPS location, as in you are right here. They combine the two and give you a forecast that will say things like, it is going to start raining on you in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's amazing. And for those of us on Android devices, they have a website called forecast.io that does the same thing. But again, this is California. There's no weather here. Um, they do also have a pretty awesome API uh, and a really neat monetization model around that. So that's time and space, but let's talk about humanity. Identity is a very complex topic, and it's something people have studied for a really long time. And where identity hits the internet is a thriving research area. Uh, and there are many papers to delve into you, but rather than showing you the academic research, I'll show you this, which is a 12-year-old boy trying to choose a screen name for a video game at 12, right? And this 12-year-old is saying, Possible good names are things like the dunkster and punk of funk, right? But do not be bread boy. Like, at 12 years old, so socially aware of the consequences of the identity that he's going to choose. Um, and we see this through Bitly data as well. Um, this is a metaphor my colleague Matt LeMay came up with to explain a phenomena we observed that uh, is somewhat counterintuitive. But what people share publicly as part of their identity is quite distinct from what they actually engage with and consume. Um, that is, that people share things that make them look good. They share you know, news articles. Uh, they share beautiful Instagram photos that make their lives look awesome. Uh, like, I certainly shared that I was here and the badge is really cool, right? Um, they share things that they feel very politically engaged with and excited about uh, and passionate about. And the same people sharing those things are clicking on things like this, uh, gossip, um, sports. Sports is a big area where many people read about it but don't actually share it and make it part of their online identity. Uh, dirty jokes. And then things in this category, note that this is on time. That is a respectable publication. And yet the headline is one that everybody will click on. We can prove it. 
Um, but very few people will share in a space at least where their mother can see it. Right. So people want to project a certain kind of identity, um, but their behavior is distinct from that. Um, that's an important thing to recognize when you're trying to engage with people online, that it's not that important to get a lot of likes or clicks, it's more important to get the right ones, and that um, finding the implicit behavior you can study is way more interesting sometimes than the explicit behavior. Now, if you haven't seen the OkCupid okay blog, you should look that up, because this blog does a fantastic job of playing with people's identity. OkCupid okay is a dating site. It is populated by people mostly in their 20s in urban areas, and they use the way that people describe themselves um, to give examples. This was one of the more PG ones I could find, in fact. Um, of how people behave in these mating situations. Now, OkCupid is also a great example of not big data. In fact, their data fits on one machine, and yet they produce amazing work with it. So social community, um, I wanted to bring up a principle called homophily, uh, which is something we observe often in social networks, and again, an anecdote to illustrate. Um, for this young woman, any white person on Twitter is, in fact, a spam account. Um, so what homophily is, is uh, essentially the notion that like groups with like, the way I use a social network is probably very similar to how you in the audience use your social networks, which is probably similar to how your friends use social networks. Um, but that is not true of the average or median user. When you pick someone at random, they use networks very differently than you do. And I believe this is why so many people are surprised by how their children use social networks, because your children are actually not adjacent to you. They're adjacent to their peers. They will use networks quite differently. Uh, that doesn't mean they're smart, though. Um, <laughs> another example is this guy on Facebook who held a funeral for his fish. And of course, the, the words are all messed up here on the big LED display, but the best part is the comment at the bottom that says, may Cod rest his soul. <laughs> I do not know these people, but I want to. If you want to play with this idea, there's a website at tweet.onerandom.com, and all it does is sit on the Twitter uh, public sprinkler hose and show you random tweets. Uh, and just to make this point that people are, in fact, nothing like you. Uh, and it's running on Heroku, so hopefully it'll stay up if everyone goes and looks at it. So one project I wanted to talk about is actually um, by Gilad Lotan at Betaworks. They're working on a product called Giphy. Uh, and if you gain nothing else from this morning's session, uh, you will at least now know that there exists an animated GIF search engine. It's called Giphy.com. And there are actually people employed as animated GIF editors who work for Giphy.com, where they find the animated GIFs and manually tag them. Uh, and they have a really wonderful set of data. So he did an analysis where he was quite surprised to find, this is Galad's work, that uh, the use of the word funny is really different than the, the word LOL, right? Um, and he was really curious about this, because intuitively, uh, they seem to mean the same thing. But he found that funny was people laughing. It was ha-ha funny. And LOL was sort of the WTF, like wacky stuff going on. Um, and this is another talk you should watch. If you're at all curious about this phenomena of what we learned from language, and this seems ridiculous, uh, and in fact, a lot of our work at Bitly was on very ridiculous data, but it is teaching us something important and fundamental about how people are communicating, which is ridiculous. Um, and so looking into emotion, just one example here, this is actually from the University of Vermont. Peter Dodds and Chris Danforth have a group there. Uh, they created something called a hedonometer. That's another word that actually was first used in the 1800s, but they've cr actually built it. It is a measurement of global happiness through Twitter data. Um, and you can just go look at it. It's hedonometer.org. Uh, and you can see, uh, it's very hard to read, but they'll actually show you for each day the words that made people happier or not happy. Uh, and you can also see that globally, we seem to be getting less happy, uh, which is probably not a good thing. Or maybe Twitter is attracting a much broader audience, you know, all those celebrities bringing their unhappiness. I don't know. Um, and so Bitly also has a little product around this called Bitly for Feelings, where you can, instead of sharing a link with a bit.ly domain, you can pick a domain like yay this uh, that says, I really like what's at the end of this link, or uh, boo, you can hate tweet now without fear. Um, this is giving uh, multi-dimensional sen sentiment information. And I've traditionally been very skeptical of sentiment analysis. 
and also wondered why we only look at positive and negative language. We don't look at, you know, angriness, uh, excitement, happiness. They're all different emotions. Um, and all the data generated by the system is open source. Uh, so I think people build some really cool stuff on it. Now, a lot of people are into the quantified self movement. This is largely around managing emotional and physical health. Uh, and I'm so grateful to the people who are crazy enough to log everything they eat and every step they take, because we are going to learn so much from the data that those insane people generate that will benefit the rest of us in a really fundamental way. So I, this is cool, right? Um, so I, I, I bracketed this talk with talking about the very beginning of data engineering and making the world computable, sort of where we are now in the present of data computing on humanity. And I'd like to say just a few words about what's next uh, or where we can go with it, because uh, I am a huge optimist uh, about data. I believe that we really are close to using it to make our lives better, to eliminate cognitive drudgery, to affect our health. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges. Uh, and I did want to call out a few. One is privacy, and this is a whole topic on itself. Again, we held a panel at Data Gotham on the topic, and the panel, after an hour, could barely establish what questions they should be asking each other rather than even approaching answers. It's a very difficult topic. But I believe there are two ways to think about it, and it's not really privacy in the traditional sense. It is privacy in the sense of what data exists about me that I don't know about, and how far away from me can that data go outside my control and knowledge? And we need to solve that as the people who are building applications so that people trust us with this data. Another fear is creativity, in that often uh, when I talk to folks on the marketing side, they say, well, you know, they're just going to use data and they won't need us anymore um, because we can A-B test. And I just want to make the point that Data will tell you whether to choose A or B, but it will not tell you what A or B should have been in the first place. Um, data is a tool for improving our creativity, much like the structure of poetry, for giving us bounds in which we can think and create. Um, and in order to explore some of that, I have a hack called Book Book Goose, where I took all the books on Amazon's, well, all the books I could get out of Amazon's API, which was about 300,000, and present them to you purely randomly. Uh, as a protest against the poor quality of their recommendation algorithms. And so far, um, we've had a few thousand people look at Book Book Goose, and I've made about $100 in affiliate fees, um, mostly from people clicking through to buy entirely different things, including someone who actually bought a pound of underwear. Um, <laughs> but it's been a really interesting exploration of the ways that we can question the tyranny of the algorithms. Um, and the final point, and one that I think is most important for this crowd, is we need the tools to do this well. Um, this is not a joke. This is real, right? So Hadoop, help, screw you. Um, and to their credit, Cloudera fixed this a few months ago. Um, but this is actually real, right? The skills you need to do meaningful data infrastructure work today are pretty hardcore engineering skills. And that unnecessarily limits access to this kind of work to a small subset of people who are happy to wade through this kind of system. Um, we need to make it so easy, it's like playing. It's not you know, like building a bridge, it's like building your cat out of Play-Doh. Um, and when we get that in the hands of people, amazing things will happen just as they happen when Microsoft Excel became standard in every office, and suddenly it became mandatory for every modern office worker to know how to use spreadsheets, which uh, used to be the domains of accountants and fairly specialized thinkers. We need to do this for data computing as well. So now we can ask the question, what does low friction data computing actually do for the world? And by low friction, I mean easy to set up, easy to work with, uh, low cost. Um, well, something like this. <laughs> All right, enough with the animated GIFs. Um, it's up to us now to actually build this stuff and to do it well uh, in a trustworthy and mindful way. Uh, and there are tons of hard engineering problems that remain. Um, problems that intersect with things we all care about, like our life in urban environments, our health, uh, the way we spend our time, uh, and how effective we are in our relationships and things like that. And there are tons of opportunities uh, to give ourselves superpowers. 
and I'll end there. Um, thank you. I hope you had fun with this. Uh, if you're smiling as you walk out the door, it's a good thing. Um, and I hope everyone has a really great day at FutureStack. And I'm Hillary. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.